Mike Gallagher is a rising star in US politics. He's charismatic, socially progressive, and keeps his distance from divisive Trump-style politics. He's a Republican and he's chairman of the House Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party. He was just in Australia where I caught up with him in Canberra. Mike Gallagher, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks for having me. Do you think in the West we mostly underestimate the threat of the Chinese Communist Party, not just in terms of its military strength, but also its foreign interference and espionage? I think there are some who see the threat clearly. Uh, here in Australia, I have to single out voices like Andrew Hastie and, and James Patterson, who I think have been speaking for a long time clearly about not only the, the, the scale of the threat, but the scope, that it is a military and ideological and a an economic threat. But for whatever reason, I think there's still a tendency both in America and Australia to underplay and discount the likelihood of a potential confrontation with China over Taiwan. Uh, and as I examine what Xi Jinping is doing, he seems to be preparing his country for that confrontation, preparing his country for war. And I really think we've entered the window of maximum danger right now when it comes to the risks of a conventional conflict with China. And we need to be moving more aggressively to deter that, to put hard power in its path before mm -hmm. it's too late. Yeah. When you look at the Biden administration, some people praise it for how it's handled the, ch the threat from China. What do you think of how they are handling the Chinese Communist Party, and particularly in our region, the, the Asia Pacific? Uh, I think the Biden administration uh, has been divided on the issue of China. Um, and I think the fundamental division is on the issue of climate change. So there are some in the administration that think that the paramount threat that we face geopolitically is climate change. And therefore, and I think John Kerry would be a good uh, example of people in this camp, therefore we need to cooperate with Xi Jinping uh, on climate change. Now, I think that's a naive view of the world. I don't think Xi Jinping cares particularly about climate change, nor do I think the CCP would ever adhere to commitments made at COP27. Uh, they violated most of the international yeah. commitments they've made. So do you think the threat from China is greater than the threat of climate change, greater than, than the threat of Russia? Absolutely. Uh, I think China is by far our, our biggest threat. Uh, I think it's a, an existential threat in, in many cases. And even if you're just analyzing it purely from an environmental perspective, mm. China's probably the worst environmental actor uh, in the world. Um, not just in terms of their emissions, but in terms of illegal fishing and a whole host of other activities. The other thing that troubles me right now is there was a I, I, there, there was some continuity between the Trump administration and the Biden administration on China that yes. I think is was positive. Um, and there, there are some in the Biden administration that think of a very realistic assessment of who we're dealing with in CCP. But over the last few months, Biden seems to have revived diplomatic and economic engagement with China as a core pillar of our grand strategy. And the risk of that is that the CCP will use our desire to sit down with them and engage as a way to slow the defensive action that we need to take, whether it's on export controls or sanctions on key Chinese officials or uh, demanding transparency on the origins of COVID, which we still don't have. And I'm going to come to that in a moment. But do you realize the same thing is happening in Australia, that our prime minister uh, is trying to get the relationship between Australia and China back on track. He's hoping to have a meeting with Xi Jinping later this year. Mm -hmm. And so there are concerns here as well that we're not standing up enough to China as we were. Yeah, I call this zombie engagement because it's a revival of a policy that's failed uh, for 20 years. Uh, and we thought it was dead and buried, and now it's rising from the grave. And I think it's built on a series of naive assumptions about how Marxist Leninist regimes operate, and there's sort of a paradox uh, at the heart of the regimes like this, which is they grow more aggressive as they grow more comfortable. So they interpret mm. our olive branch as an invitation to aggression. And again, I, I'm, I'm fine with establishing a crisis communication channel. I would love it if our military officials were talking so that we reduce the risk of an unintentional confrontation. Yes. But the problem is we've tried to establish that channel under the Trump administration, under Biden, and the CCP refuses. Now let's move on to the origins of COVID-19. This is a topic that you have cared and spoken about passionately for the past three years. We've seen recently the emails that were subpoenaed by Congress that shows that scientists and Anthony Fauci in the very earliest days of the pandemic clearly were concerned not only that the virus leaked 
from the Wuhan laboratory, but that it may have been genetically engineered. Yet the most recent intelligence community statement from the ODNI, the declassified statement, and I know it was a joke of in intelligence to be declassified, but, but my point is that even in that statement, the IC, most elements of the IC still assess that the virus wasn't genetically engineered. How can they be running this false claim, particularly in light of those private emails subpoenaed from the scientists? Uh, it makes no sense. And if you go back even further, I think to April uh, of the first stage of the pandemic, the, the DNI released a statement proactively saying that the intelligence community agrees with the strong scientific consensus that this was not man-made or genetically yeah. modified. That was crazy. I mean, and we still haven't gotten the assessment that we've demanded on the intelligence community from the DNI. Granted, this was in the previous administration, but the documents presumably still exist as to what that was based on. So what we saw during the pandemic was, I think, an underlying the intelligence community's lack of transparency is the complete politicization of the scientific establishment, yeah. right? Because I suspect that the DNI was relying on the same ethically compromised scientists that many in the, in the media were relying upon. And foremost among them is Anthony Fauci. And I think 10 years from now, we're gonna look back on this whole thing and the name Fauci will be associated with the perversion of science, the politicization of public health. I mean, those emails re reveal that, that the scientists that were talking to Fauci had concerns about the Wuhan Institute of Virology, uh, the potential role of gain of function research uh, in this. And then they did everything possible to pour cold water on the lab leak hypothesis. And I believe in an effort to cover themselves, their own reputation, because of course, Anthony Fauci was the godfather of gain of function research. And were it not for your reporting, were it not for Josh Rogan's reporting, were it not for some brave scientists like Alina Chen, we wouldn't have gotten the full story. Um, so, uh, I think that also explains why a lot of Americans, at least, uh, have lost a lot of faith in the public health and scientific establishment. And that's unfortunate, right? Mm. To suppress dissent is the antithesis of science. It's the antithesis of the scientific method. But that's precisely what Anthony Fauci mm. and his group of scientists and people like uh, Peter Daszak did. Yeah. And so what do we need to do to conclusively get to the bottom of this? You yeah. know, if you were in charge, what would what would you do? I think complete de declassification of, uh, unless there were something that clearly imperiled a sensitive source and method, and I haven't yes. seen that, let us err on the side of declassification, even if it angers the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah. I think we should be willing to impose sanctions on Chinese entities scientific and otherwise until they are more transparent about the origins of the virus. I think the obvious thing we should do is uh, prohibit uh, any taxpayer dollars uh, for the funding of gain of function research because if this has taught us anything it's that there are severe risks to doing experiments with naturally occurring coronavirus to make them more chimeric and more pathogenic. Um, but ultimately I do think it's the executive branch purview to be more forward leaning in terms of demanding answers from the CCP mm. as well as declassifying everything that we have. Mm. And then perhaps there's a fourth effort that we can take to engage the scientists that want to rehabilitate the reputation of public health surrounding the pandemic to, uh, to actually have an open and honest debate about the origins of COVID based on what we know now. And there are a lot of international scientists who are deeply committed to this and, and to this question as well. Look, at the moment, it does look like Trump is clearly ahead in uh, the Republic, um, among Republican voters. But with all of the criminal cases against him, the view is that he would be then unlikely to win a general election. How disappointing for the United States would it be, do you think, if we ended up with either him as president or Joe Biden again? Well, I just think to have a Trump-Biden rematch would, I mean, I think a lot of Americans would be questioning, is this the best uh, we can do? Uh, uh, again, in terms of uh, their age as well as uh, uh, their overall policy approaches, I think the American people are hungry for something different, something new. So we'll see. It's still early in the maybe primary you, process. Maybe you <laughs> next year. I'm too boring. I'm too bookish. I mean, who would who would want, uh, would want me? Um, but... Uh, my hope is that uh, we'll at least have a, a, a robust debate in the Republican primary that isn't just a pure personality test that's, mm. you know, about actual issues and policies, because I am, as I as we've talked about, I'm very concerned about the next five years uh, for American foreign policy. And it's going to require 
extraordinary presidential leadership to navigate the twin sort of geopolitical crisis we face in the form of dealing with the Chinese Communist Party, yeah. as well as the fiscal domestic crisis that we're going to face in America. That's going to require extraordinary Reagan-type leadership, and um, I I'm not sure. I'm, I'm confident that Biden is not up to that task. Mike Gallagher, thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you.